and we're live. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Where's the Funding, hosted by the Fiber Broadband Association and sponsored by Broadband.Money. I'm Gary Bolton, the President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association, and this is our third episode of 2023. You know, this is a 12-part series designed to help you understand, navigate, and obtain matching funds for broadband grants. The NTI bead program requires broadband applicants to come to the table with a minimum of 25% matching funds and a letter of credit up front with the applications. You know, for many smaller providers and non-traditional providers and communities, this may sound daunting, but it doesn't have to be. This 12-part series is designed to help you understand how and why meeting these requirements can be straightforward. So last month, we had a great session and did a deep dive into bead with Evan Feynman, the director of the $42.45 billion NTI Broadband Equity Access and Deployment bead program. If you missed this episode, I highly recommend you watch the replay as Evan is very forthcoming in his answers and discussions on some of the gotchas on the bead program. It was an extremely informative and instructive session. Today on Where's the Funding, we're gonna focus on the capital stack with our guest, David Harton, the president of ITC Holding. During this episode, you'll learn how to identify the right sources of capital for your business and how to structure these sources to secure the necessary funding. David Harton is the president of ITC Holding Company. ITC invests in telecom, technology, financial services, transaction, transaction processing, and real estate. Prior to ITC, David was the co-founder and president and CEO of Notora, a RF engineering firm, and he has extensive history in telecom. David graduated from Auburn with a BS in electrical engineering. So welcome, David. And for audience, please put your questions in the chat and we'll work those into discussion as we go. Um, so to start off, you know, David, ITC is a really interesting company with a really rich history that dates back to, 19, or excuse me, 1896. Can you share with our audience how a train conductor ended up as a telephone operator, then an ISP, and then where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, thanks for having me, Gary. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm sitting outside, actually, an Alabama state grant meeting uh, in Monroeville, Alabama today, so hopefully there won't be any background noise. But um, ITC does date back to 1896. Um, our uh, chairman, Cam Lanier, his great-grandfather, uh, was a train conductor and he would take a group of people from West Point, Georgia to Atlanta in the morning and then take them home in the evening. So he had a lot of downtime during the day. And uh, during that downtime, uh, he was at a state fair one day and saw a booth where they were selling telephones. So he bought 32 telephones, I believe, brought them back to West Point, Georgia and started uh, Interstate Telephone Company. So um, the Lanier family ran that from 1896 to the 1990s uh, when they broke up the bells and uh, sold the business then uh, because they, they were a little concerned about competition coming into the market. Um, and then from there, you know, uh, they started a, a long distance carrier um, that was sold to, to MCI. And uh, don't worry, they're, they're paid in cash for that. So uh, we didn't get caught up into any of the MCI mess. But from there, we started looking a lot more like private equity. So, you know, when I was first introduced to ITC as a uh, co-op student at Powertel, we had three publicly traded companies uh, right there in West Point. So ITC, Deltacom, Knology, and Powertel. And uh, we've continued to invest in and, and help grow broadband and other technology companies since. So, David, um, can you maybe, you've had a pretty interesting career as well. Can you share with us how an RF engineer ends up as a financier? Um, well, I'd love to say I had a grand plan for all that, but um, really, I think it's uh, divine divine intervention and uh, dumb luck, a little bit of all that. But I started my career at Powertel uh, as a co-op student while I was still getting my engineering degree. Um, right at the time I was graduating, Powertel was being sold to VoiceStream, so all the corporate employees that were being retained from West Point were being relocated to Seattle. Uh, I really had no interest in that. Um, so I took a job with Nextel in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, which was great because I think we had three cell sites when I started. Uh, so we got to grow that from about three to over 120. And then we were moved to Atlanta to start an in-building program 
which focused on uh, coverage indoors. Uh, Nextel in particular, because they're a, a B2B company, uh, we found quickly that we couldn't close accounts if we didn't have coverage in their main office. So we would do, you know, commit certain number of units for a certain number of years. And so my job was to design those, those systems and bring in contractors to install them. Um, so I hung around there until uh, Sprint acquisition and, and a few years after that. And then uh, Sprint just made it uh, really advantageous to, to leave. So um, based on the severance they were giving people, and it was kind of a voluntary plan, uh, myself and a couple other guys at Sprint decided, you know, if we're going to start a company, now would be a great time to do that. And so um, so we left there and started Connectivity Wireless. Um, I really loved the entrepreneurial environment of, you know, writing big proposals when you're just three guys in a basement. Um, but we grew that company uh, until from 2008 to 2014 when we brought in a private equity firm. Uh, that created an opportunity for me to, to leave and start my own thing. So I sold my piece of that started Notora. We grew that successfully, sold it in 2019. I hung around as the CEO until a private equity firm came in and, and bought the uh, majority of the company that had bought Notora. So that gave me a chance to check all the way out. And um, I really thought I was going to start another business. That was my goal. And so I met Cam Lanier, who's our chairman, really thinking I was lining up an investor. But um, Cam had other designs. So he brought me on as president. Um, as been a huge learning curve, um, but I love it. You know, I'm enjoying meeting with entrepreneurs. Um, having done it twice myself, uh, it's really rewarding to get to help, you know, invest in and coach up and advise um, companies in our portfolio. Well, I can't think of who would be better to help operators than someone who's been there, done that, and built these uh, networks. So, you know, thanks, David, for sharing that with us. So let's talk about the capital stack can let's start with defining what is the capital stack and why is it important for operators to understand the different kinds of funding available well the capital stack is is just what you said it's this the funding you use to get your business off the ground um and and i a mentor shared this with me and i can't emphasize enough that ultimately for all successful businesses your customers will be your main source of funding for your business right um banks, private equity firms, folks like us, our main goal is to help you get to a point where your customers are your main funding source. So we're really bridging that gap. Um, but in the stack, you know, you've got um, bank debt. That's probably considered your, your cheapest form of funding. Um, the challenge that you're going to have as entrepreneurs, though, is banks have pretty strict um, metrics that they use. So you know, most commonly it's going to be, you know, three to four times your, your EBITDA, your cash flow. So if you're not profitable yet, that's not going to be an option for you. Um, and if you are profitable, it's, you know, it's capped at a, at a fairly, um, I don't say small amount, but it when small relative to say a big fiber build. Um, but, you know, as a private equity firm, we certainly don't look down on companies that have a, a reasonable amount of bank debt because it is a pretty low cost um, source. Uh, you know, after after bank debt, um, you have mezzanine debt, which is a little bit, you know, more risky for the lender. So it's going to cost you more interest rates, you know, in the 15 to 20 percent range most of the time. Um, and, and for mezzanine debt, that's really going to be as an entrepreneur, you got to decide if your growth is going to outpace the high interest rates that you're paying. You know, uh, it, there's a big debate amongst CFOs if mezzanine debt is cheaper than, than say, an equity investment. Um, and, and my personal apparent opinion is going to be that really, again, just depends on how fast you're going to grow and can you sustain that. You know, one downside to debt is uh, the debt payment's got to go every month. So if your business is lumpy on the revenue, um, you, you may not actually ever realize your full potential because you've got to make that payment regardless of what's coming in on your end. Um, on the other hand, if you are a steady monthly recurring revenue business and it's going, it may make all the sense in the world to do something like that. Um, and then, you know, the next step in the stack is, is what I would call a convertible note. That's kind of a bridge between debt and equity. Um, we use convertible notes a lot for really two reasons. Um, one is on our side, if, 
if you need cash, you can say in the next 30 days, that's really not enough time for us to do all the homework we need to do to decide if you're a good investment. Um, but we'll do a convertible note because it's fairly low risk, right? It's debt. It's usually a smaller amount. It gets you funding that you need to, to continue the, the equity conversation with us. Um, the other reason, the other thing we use convertible notes for is, is a valuation gap. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the owner thinks they're worth X. We think they're, they're worth Y, but we still think apart from the valuation gap, this is a, still a good investment. We like the CEO. We like where they're headed. We like the markets they're in. So we'll use a, a convertible note to kind of um, bridge the conversation on how much you're worth. Uh, because and, and normally there's some components to that. There'll be, you know, like a cap that says, all right, well, if you really are worth X, then we'll can, we can convert to equity at that at a later date. Or, um, you know, the true test of what you're worth is, is what somebody's willing to pay. So if another investor comes in, there'll be a function of that note that says we could convert at a discount to what they're coming in at. Uh, because we took the risk with you earlier, um, or it can just be paid out as debt. So that's probably the the third spoke of the stack. And then the, the next one would be just straight equity. And that's where we play mostly. And, and um, equity, you know, some people say it's expensive. I, I don't think about it that way. I think about what you gain as a partner and, and what the doors that a company like ours can open for you um, to help you go further faster is, is totally worth it in a lot of a lot of cases. So as a CEO, my advice would be when you look at equity partners, really decide who do you want to partner with. Um, and, and there's better fits for different firms. You know, um, some are more hands on, some are more hands off, some are more industry knowledge, some are more purely financial. Um, so my recommendation there would just be, you know, as you're going through the process, make sure that uh, the private equity firm you're talking to fits your culture, uh, agrees with kind of your vision of where you want to take the company. Um, and the rest generally tends to work itself out. So when you're looking at, um, you know, equity partners, you know, some of the, you mentioned, um, you know, I, so I did a couple startups and, uh, we probably raised, uh, between two startups about $300 million and, it was really important that, that we really had the right partners. Now everybody, I mean, you can get money from a lot of places, but is that, you know, I did, you just went through the whole history of all the networks that you built in the past. Is that what you bring to the table is kind of your expertise and you really know this industry or what, what is it that, that you guys bring to the table as equity partner? Yeah, I would say ITC is really more focused on being an operational partner. So if it's uh, connections you need, if it's, experience standing up um, customer service organizations and things of that nature of knowing, you know, contractors, uh, relationships, things like that. I think we bring that to the table. Um, you know, I'll take a step back. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend when you're looking at financial partners um, is the financial partner needs to be this, uh, the same size that you are. So if you're looking at banks and you're a startup, I would find a small bank, right? A, a bank that you could go play golf with the CEO um, uh, and, and talk about growth and talk about problems. Same thing with private equity, right? There's sweet spots. You know, for us, it's about 10 million to about 500 million. That's where we play. Um, there are firms that, you know, they don't start until you're at least 100 million. Uh, and then there's also more venture funds that, that, you know, work with you on a purely startup basis. So probably size and fit matter there as well. Now let's talk about grants. So not all grants are good grants. So what should an operator be looking at when they're choosing which grants to, you know, and you know, what the funding purpose is? Man, I'm glad you asked that question uh, because we see this all the time. Tragically is that you, somebody may have won a, a $50 million grant, but when you look at the unit metrics, when you dial it down to the cost per passing, uh, the grant still doesn't make sense. So for us, you know, we like to see somewhere between $1,200, uh, maybe up to $1,500 of passing that you're paying for after the grant. Uh, you know, if you think about it, the real intent of the grant is to, is to cover the gap between what it's really going to cost and what you would have paid for it, you know, to get a reasonable ROI as an operator. So be thinking about that because if, if after the grant you're still at, you know, $4,000 of passing, that still won't work. 
So it's very important and you, you're exactly right. Not all grants are good grants. Um, they've they've got to be grants that get you to a reasonable ROI or in some cases better. And, and we've worked with companies that maybe the first grant didn't get them there, but they've been able to stack a federal and a state and a county grant that do get them to that $1,200 benchmark or below. Um, but you, you definitely have to make sure you've done your homework, you've done your cost estimates um, before you sign up for taking on grants. So, I mean, like in Ardoff, we saw um, some people bid down to 1% of the reserve. So they're basically taking on some very high cost area for very little subsidy. Uh, is there, when you're looking at the strategic value of claiming, you know, or trying to attack, uh, attack certain locations, and maybe it's there as you go to what um, a prime location, you might be going pie and you don't want competition. Is there a time when you would kind of, for strategic reasons, you know, go much higher on a cost per home passed? Or is it, I mean, do you look at this in the aggregate or do you look at every location um, on its own? I'd say you look at it in aggregate and you're right. There are strategic reasons. So if you're defending your territory, um, that may make sense. If you, if you, maybe you turn down the federal grant because you know you, you're going to get a local grant to do it. Um, that's the case. You know, I, I know of one company that, um, uh, you know, they bid art off, but their, their cost per passing is actually not what it would cost to construct because, you know, they're, they're a software upgrade away from actually delivering the speeds that, that the grant requires. So say they're running a wireless network at, 25.3, but they know the, the network's capable of doing 100 by 20. They just haven't been running that hot. Um, that might be a case to do it, but those are those are the exception and not the rule, right? The rule should be be disciplined in your financial analysis. Now, I know you're an RF guy and I'm a fiber guy, um, but when you look at investments, you know, fiber seems to be very, very creative. Do you tend to encourage fiber investment or do you think um, is fixed wireless and other technologies um, fine? Or what do you look at when you look at the actual network they're building? Um, you know, I think all the technologies out there are just tools in the toolbox and there's, there's a appropriate tool for each application. Um, for me, you know, putting my, my financial hat on though, um, there's definitely a multiple um, hire for fiber companies. So if you are wireless, even if you can deliver 100 by 20, you've got to think about, you know, if the if the requirements are raised, how are you going to get there? And also think about just as an entrepreneur who wants to exit one day, you know, a, a WISP is going to sell from five to eight. If it's strategic, it might get as high as 10 times EBITDA. Fiber companies, you know, north of 15. So you're getting more value for your investor, the, the more hard asset, the more fiber assets you have. So that's what brings up a good point. You know, with right now, there's over 1,100 fiber providers across the country with all this in, uh, investment. There's going to be a whole lot more in the next couple of years. Um, so there's got to be some market consolidation here in the next few years. So when you're taking money and, in, and people, you know, and you're investing, how should operators look at that? Um, should they, you know, you don't want to end up in a poison pill kind of situation, right? How, how do, you, do you look at what... Um, an M and A situation is going to be down the road, and and what's makes sense there versus what you need today. Yeah, well, that's a mistake I see um, when when entrepreneurs pitch to us. I, I see that mistake made all the time is they don't have a great vision. You know, their their uh, their their pitch might be, well, we're just going to be opportunistic. Um, that's really hard for a private equity firm to get behind, right? We, we expect that you know your business way better than we do. So when we meet with you, you know, we'd love to talk about, all right, well, this funding is going to be used for building fiber or for the matching portion of this grant to build here, right? We need a narrative. And so you will often ask, well, beyond that, you know, how, how much bigger could you get? Um, are, there, are there neighboring companies that you could acquire and consolidate? You know, what does that look like? And so, and so what we're looking for is just a thoughtful, reasonable answer from um, CEOs. We fully understand that the future may not turn out the way you, you know, you predict it to be. But we we really want to see that you've got a plan, you've got a vision, because that's how 
private equity makes money, right? We're going to pay market value for your business today in anticipation that it's, we're going to grow together and then exit down the road. Um, so yeah, you, you absolutely need to be thinking about consolidation, both from a, what could you acquire that would make you more valuable? And also, you know, who'd be a likely suitor for your network? So, I mean, that's a good point, David, is the, you know, not necessarily that you would sell out, but, um, you know, private equity loves to be able to take a lot of fragmented markets and then build into, you know, a much uh, more accretive value by adding some operators together. Is that, do you think, when you talk to your um, CEOs, is that what they're looking at is how could they big, be bigger? Do they just kind of say, hey, I'm a hometown. This is kind of my comfort level. And uh, I I would say that. It's all over the place, Gary. I mean, we, we, what we look for are the, the entrepreneurs that want to grow their business. Um, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a lifestyle business. And, you know, you're in a small town, you're fairly isolated from competition. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But when we talk about capital stack and investment, probably not, you know, a, a partner for us. If that's the mentality that, that you're running your business by. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's totally fine. Um, it's just not going to be something that we would want to get behind. So what are some of the common issues that operators run into? You know, when you're, if, when someone comes to you, you know, I would have to think cash flows up the top, but as you're, you know, the challenge is there's all this money coming, but you know, if you have to have a 25% match and you have to, um, build before you get reimbursed and you have to, um, have a letter of credit. I mean, what are the things that you're seeing? Um, all the above, uh, and I would, you know, just pause for a little bit, you know, we're, we're targeting this conversation to network owners. Um, if you're a services company, you know, this is probably not, uh, you may or may not need private equity because your, your payrolls, your likely your biggest expense, except for tools and trucks and things like that. Um, but when network is your biggest expense, I think you've got to think about, um, owning a smaller piece of a bigger pie because you're going to need capital from outside and whether that's from us or, or anybody. Um, so you got to be th thinking that that's the, the ultimate direction of your company. Um, but yeah, letters of credit are, are tough for people um, because that's just cash sitting in the bank. Um, you know, the, the, they've maxed out bank debt, that sort of thing. Um, so we, we see that. And if that's you, you know, just know that that's not uncommon, right? You, you're not, you're not alone in those issues, but there are folks like us that can come alongside you and help. So what are, um, well, I guess I, I even hesitate to bring this up, but, you know, I spent the weekend studying the whole Silicon Valley bank. They were a partner with us with, in my first startup. And it's just shocking to, you wouldn't think that, a bank like Silicon Valley Bank would have a run on it and just, um, you know, the repercussions that that's having. What, I mean, how should people think about the current environment with the Fed cranking up interest rates and, you know, some of the volatility that we've seen, of, you know, even kind of, you know, places like SVB? Yeah, I, I think it's inflation is probably the bigger issue, but, you know, markets are tightening. Um, we've seen... Uh, a lot of the big guys miss their build numbers um, because of lack of labor and because equipment's going up. So, you know, as you're doing your your cost analysis for builds, you probably need to build in a factor of things costing a little bit more. Um, you know, as, as far as Silicon Valley goes, um, this is just a personal opinion, no insider information. But I feel like that's going to be more of a one off um, example of bad management. So I think the local banks that you're with now is a business probably just fine, you know, serving you for the purpose that they are. Um, but I do think the overall economy is, is, you know, continuing to worsen. And so that means capital is going to cost more. Um, some of the deals that were happening, you know, two and three years ago with really high multiples is probably going to be tempered a little bit. Um, but, you know, the, I think as long as you're going into it with realistic expectations, there's still good opportunities for you to find a partner that can help you grow. So what are some of the, the lessons that you've learned? You know, um, I mean, there's a number of things that could, you know, as people come to take on financing, what, what, what are the kind of the things to look out for? 
Yeah, I, if I were coaching a CEO who's going to, to pitch to anybody, um, I would say first, just make sure you know your numbers, right? We're, we're um, looking at you to know your business better than we do. So just make sure, you know, number of subscribers, your annual revenue, your monthly revenue, your EBITDA, you know, make sure you know those things going into the meeting. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is, is just make sure your valuation expectations are right. Um, so many times uh, we meet with entrepreneurs and they're thinking that, um, you know, they heard a valuation that somebody got a couple years ago and, and just make sure that's applicable to your business, right? Because as you, the smaller you are, the smaller the multiple is going to be because the less the upside. So if you're at a hundred thousand dollar annual revenue, uh, you're not worth the same as a $10 million company that's thrown off, you know, three or $4 million in EBITDA. Not yet. Right. So having the expectation that, say, the bigger company you've heard about sold for and what yours is worth today, probably not apples to apples. So just make sure that you're coming in with similar size businesses um, and that your expectations are kind of set accordingly. Now, what about um, like, the big issue now, you know, what you mentioned, inflation and um, the construction costs. So when you, you know, you're taking on the risk of the build and you don't know what you know, the availability of labor and construction costs and the timing and permitting, and there's a lot of risk. So how should, what should you be building in on that? And how do you look at that? Um, you know, I would try to get as many real quotes as you can when you're doing your, um, your analysis, uh, you know, bake in a 10% contingency factor, something like that. Um, because we don't know what the future is going to hold there. Um, and the, the good news, though, I guess it's good news, uh, is that everybody's feeling that same pressure, right? It's not unique to us uh, or in any one company that construction costs are going up. Uh, you know, guys that um, that are skilled at building fiber networks and, and wireless networks, too, they're in, they're in high demand and short supply. So I just, you know, had um, Joy Wender from Treasury on um, my five for breakfast this morning and I asked him about the two CFR part 200. How are you guys looking at this? Cause I mean, if, if you have some take on some federal money and it limits your ability to use revenue that's generated from the project um, and also limits your, you know, where you actually, your potential future ownership of that investment. I mean, how are you guys looking at this? Well, that, that kind of, circles back to our earlier conversation of not all grants are good grants. So just make sure you fully understand all the details uh, and you're comfortable with the, the downside of, of that. Um, you know, there's a big question of, about how much of the network do you have to own to, to retain value? Uh, I think that's where you're going with this one. You know, we, we've seen, um, uh, you know, most, most fiber providers today don't do all their own middle mile. They have a partner um, to do that. So that's okay. Um, we've seen lease models come out where, you know, you, the, the provider owns the drops and, and really nothing else in the network. Um, so, so the question is, I, the answer to that question is, I don't really know, Gary, it, it's really going to depend on how much value is retained in owning the customer versus how much is, is owned in the, the network itself. And each grant is a little bit different. So just make sure you understand all of it before you sign up for it. So, you know, June 30th is the big date, right? When the uh, NTI is going to do the allocation and every state's going to get, you know, whether Alabama gets a billion and Texas gets three billion and, and so forth. And then, you know, they've got their five year plans. And so that money's start going to start flowing here. Uh, and I, when I hear from like um, Louisiana and others, they're going to be, you know, right after June 30th, they're going to start launching their grant programs. So, what should, I mean, today's March 15th, what should operators, anybody that wants to participate in BEAD, what, when they, should they be calling you and what should they be preparing for to get ready for this money? Um, you know, at first say, just make sure you're reaching out to your local state broadband offices so that you understand all the requirements uh, ahead of time, as many as you can. So you have an idea of what the letter of credit you might be required looks like. Um, whether the grant's on a reimbursement basis and how often that reimbursement happens so that you can have a, a, a good picture of what you need. And then once you have that, um, 
it's really not too early to start talking to, to private equity um, so that we can wrap our head around the market, do our diligence. And, uh, you know, if you don't win, then no harm, no foul. We learned some things and, and uh, you did too. But if you do win, you can go in confidently that you've got a partner that can help see you through the build. So I would say as soon as you understand the requirements that are on you, come see us. Well, David, thanks so much for taking the time to meet with us. And uh, good luck at the state broadband meeting there. Say hello to my good friend, Maureen Neighbor, the, the state office there. And I really appreciate your sharing your insights on the capital stack and all the work that you and your team are helping to get operators to take advantage of building out our nation's critical broadband infrastructure. And I want to well, thank hey, everybody thanks. for Have joining us there. today and look forward to getting back together on April 19th, the next episode of Where is the Funding? We're going to be discussing the intro to private sources, banks, family offices, foundations, and more. So you're not going to want to miss that. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Gary. See you.